Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Trish Hatch on Data-Driven School Counseling in a Multi-Tiered System of Supports. Just to let you know, if you have any questions for the presenter, please send them through the, the Zoom chat function. And please send them when you think of them. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. But please send them through the chat function and send them when you think of them. Next slide, please. Upcoming webinars, October 21st, Jessica Hannigan and John Hannigan, Building Behavior, How to Select and Implement Behavior Initiatives. October 28th, Joanne Quinn and Michael Fullen, What's Deep About Deep Learning? And November 4th, Deidre LeFevre, Kay Twyford, and Fiona L, Adaptive Expertise and Professional Learning. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dina Meyer, Executive Marketing Manager at Corwin, to introduce today's presenter. Hi everyone, and thanks Jeff. I have the pleasure today of introducing today's presenter. Trish Hatch is President and CEO of Hatching Results, which provides training and consultation across the nation on evidence-based school, school counseling practice and the use of data to increase outcomes for students. Trish is a former school counselor, high school administrator, central office administrator, and professor at San Diego State University, where she was director of the school counseling program from 2004 through, through, through 2015. Dr. Hatch is the best-selling author of multiple Corwin titles, as well as a co-author of the ASCA National Model 2003 and 2005. She has received many state and national school counseling awards, including the Excellence in Education Award from the National Association of College Admission Counseling and the inaugural California Association of School Counselors School Counselor Educator of the Year Award in 2016. Trish is also a proud grandmother, international traveler, and gracious mentor to many future school counselors. Trish, let's jump right into your immensely valuable insights on data-driven school counseling in a multi-tiered system of supports. Well, thank you so much. I am so excited to be here to talk to you today about new insights into the multi-tiered, multi-domain system of support. And I'm so excited to talk about it because there's been so much forward progress in the profession of school counseling recently. And it's exciting to see that school counselors are really on the forefront of designing, implementing, evaluating, and improving outcomes for kids. Today, our attendees will gain new insight into how our multi-tiered, multi-domain system of support aligns with the ASCA national model. We'll talk about some guidelines and strategies you can use when you design, implement, and evaluate your tiered models of support. And we'll talk a little bit about management tools and give you some strategies and ideas. So that's a lot to do in about 45 minutes. We better get started. So I don't know about you, but when I was in my school counselor graduate program and I graduated back in 1987, we did talk about tiered supports, but at the time we called them pyramids of intervention. I don't know if any of our folks out there remember that. And by the way, good time to pause and say thank you to all of the over 700 people who have joined us today. And a special shout out to the more than 50 super, uh, principals that are online. We are so excited that you're here because without you, school counselors strive, but they don't thrive. So we need our administrators and we need your support. So thank you so much for being here. So when I was first a school counselor, and there you can see me years before the hair went white, we did pyramids of intervention, but they weren't categorized the way they are today. Since then, we've had a lot of shifts. We've had RTI and PBIS, and we've had a lot of our, pro our professional colleagues and researchers who have been putting together research on school counseling and MTSS for many years. You can see a list of some of the more recent articles there, and I would strongly encourage you, if you're interested in MTSS, to take a look at some of these of uh, my colleagues' uh, work that they have done, as well as the very bottom reference there, the Goodman, Scott, Betters, Guban, Donahue book, which is on school counselors and multi-tiered system of support that was just released this year. And it's excellent tool for school counselors who are looking at MTSS. So traditionally within an MTSS framework, you talk about a whole class research-based core instruction, 
Then we talk about targeted interventions in small groups and individualized intensive supports. But the challenge has been that when we've been working with districts, some of whom have gotten education on RTI, some of whom have received information on PBIS, and then now MTSS, sometimes school counselors wonder, how do I fit into this? Are we really working with the academic piece of this in RTI? Are we working with the PBIS piece of this in social emotional? Well, now with MTSS, it's kind of an umbrella over all of this. But when you think about it for school counselors, there's a little bit of a problem because we work in three domains. School counselors work with academic development, social emotional development, and college and career development. And when you look at this triangle here, it's terrific for organizing what we do for all kids, some kids and few kids. But if you only focus on academic and social emotional and you don't put that college and career inside here, then we're missing a piece of the important and necessary and vital work of a school counselor. Now, of course, we want students to graduate college and career ready. We need to make sure that we support their academic and their social emotional. But what would it look like if we also include what all students deserve to receive because they breathe in tier one at college and career. So when I was working with one of the districts that was going towards MTSS, they asked me, how will we make sure counselors aren't on the periphery of this? How can we make sure school counselors are central to this work in MTSS in our district? And so just playing around with the triangle, I decided to pull it apart and put college and career in the middle there, as you can see where that red circle is. And so if you take the concept of what was on the previous slide and apply it here, you can see that in tier one, we're looking at what types of services would all students receive? And then in tier two, what agreed upon data elements would we as school counselors, just as teachers do, create to determine which students receive the appropriate intervention to qualify for a tier two support? We hope that would only be one, some students. And then, what type of data would we use to decide if a student received the next level of interventions? Or perhaps go right to tier three, as sometimes happens, of course, in the world of school counseling. So as I was thinking about this and aligning it with the work of the ASCA model, it's really the deliver component, the direct and indirect services that students offer that are the, the bars that go across here, the green, the yellow, and the, I guess that's pink or salmon color at the top. Um, that's ways counselors deliver their student direct services, the curriculum, the individual student planning, the small groups, the individual counseling, as well as indirect delivery of services. When you may be overseeing school-wide activities, you may be doing consultation, collaboration, and referral to additional resources. The Ask a National model now looks like this on the left. And for those of you who are haven't heard about that and you would like to know that it's changed, I'll just give you a little bit of history here. The ASCA model has changed from its draft edition, first edition and second edition, where Judy Bowers and I really were responsible to work together with many of the amazing leaders in the profession of school counseling to put sort of in a blender everything everyone was doing and begin to think about how could we design a model program to implement for students so that there'd be one vision, one voice in the profession. And ASCA organized and oversaw all of this and took on the creation of the ASCA model. After the second edition was released, ASCA then released a third edition to respond to the needs of school counselors as they received recommendations for revision nationwide. And in 2002, they came out with a new version. And as you can see, some changes were made. But we still are looking at direct and indirect services for students, what we do with students and what we do for students in that delivery, even if it isn't specifically identified there. Now this summer, ASCA again released a new version of the model, the fourth edition. And as you can see, they've slightly changed some of the, um, the names of the, of the areas to define, deliver, manage, and assess. But ultimately, the most important piece in this to know today is that data and outcome and designing and delivering and evaluating school counseling programs is central and core to the role of a school counselor and that it aligns with the work we do in MTSS. And I encourage those of you who want to know more about the ASCA model to go to the American School Counselor Association website and begin to take a look at that work. So at this, oh, I missed one slide, sorry. Um, ASCA has also aligned MTSS to the ASCA model. They have a position statement on it. If you haven't seen that, it would be a good idea to take a look because it does talk about how school counselors alike align their work in the three domains, that we collaborate across all service disciplines, 
It's for all students. And of course, we're analyzing not only the data to deci decide which students receive an intervention, but we're also looking at the outcomes to determine the effectiveness of these supports and interventions. So I'm gonna pause for a moment and I'm gonna have you watch a three minute video that describes the tier one, two, and three portion of this model. And I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go out of my, here, and I'm gonna pull it up. And this is also on our website, we'll share with you later where it is on the Hatching Results website. And I'm gonna open it up and play it for you. And as a college and career, Hi. I'd like you to um, think about some of the words that stand out for you in tier one, two, and three. And then we'll talk about them a little in a little more uh, detail as we go through the webinar. This is Trish Hatch, and today we are going to talk about the multi-tiered, multi-domain system of supports, or MTMDSS. As educators, we're familiar with the multi-tiered system of support, or MTSS, which focuses on students' academic and behavioral needs. But for school counselors who focus on three domains, academic, college and career, and social-emotional development, we need a more robust system. We need a multi-tiered, multi-domain system of supports, or MTMDSS. In MTMDSS, school counselors ensure that all students receive the instruction and support they need to grow academically, develop socially and behaviorally, and to prepare for post-secondary options. In this system, activities, instruction, and intervention services are grouped into tiers, ranging from tier one services a core program of universal supports that apply to everyone, to tier two services, or targeted interventions, which would typically only apply to approximately 20% of students. And finally, to tier three services, intentional interventions, which would typically apply to between five and 10% of students. MTMDSS provides a data-driven approach to determining which of these levels of interventions or tiers are appropriate for any individual student. Under MTMDSS, Tier 1 encompasses agreed upon services that all students receive, such as standards and competency based school counselor core curriculum lessons, individual student planning, which includes four and six year academic and post secondary plans, and district and school wide agreed upon activities and events. Tier 1 is designed to be comprehensive, preventative, developmental, and proactive. Tier two is designed for students who are exhibiting barriers to learning, struggling academically, or are deserving of additional supports. It uses database decision-making to select at-risk indicators, such as attendance, behavior, credit efficiency, and post-secondary readiness data. Targeted intervention data elements, grade levels, and timeframes are queried to determine which students qualify for interventions. Depending on the student, Tier 2 interventions may include short-term individual or small group counseling, progress monitoring, consultation, collaboration, and or referrals to resources within or outside the school building. Tier 3 services are designed for students experiencing emergency or crisis response events or to support students with needs that remain unresolved within Tier 2. School counselors provide short-term solution-focused counseling, consultation, and when appropriate, referral to additional resources. Over time, MTMDSS allows school counselors to spend more time implementing proactive Tier 1 action plans and less time engaged in reactive Tier 2 and Tier 3 activities. The ultimate goal is to ensure all students achieve their greatest potential and graduate ready for post-secondary success. So if you're wondering where this is located, it would be on the Hatching Results website under videos. And now we are going to go back to our webinar where we will locate it and present. There we go. So as you were listening to this, it went rather quickly and you might wanna have a little more detail. So that's what we're going to do now. So MTSS tier one, MTMDSS tier one with all three domains would include three main components school counseling curriculum, which the new model calls instruction, which basically means that school counselors are teaching lessons curriculum in the classroom to students. Um, it's, not, it's not really a presentation of material, it's more instruction of material. Just like teachers, school counselors would have goals, objectives, and outcomes, and measure the impact of the curriculum they teach uh, in the three domain areas, just as any other educator who's teaching a core curriculum would do. 
individual student planning is those four and six year plans or eight year plans that are comprehensive and for all students as they're planning their post-secondary options. And then school-wide program and activities, which we will talk about in just a moment. So when we think about school counseling core curriculum, what is it? Well, it's really for every student. And, and when counselors work together to decide what every student deserves to receive because they breathe, we're really looking at an all means all world where it's not just for those students who know where the counselor's office is located to find out what is financial aid and how do I access it, but school counselors decide that this is part of their core curriculum lessons and then they decide with, when they will begin to introduce that topic to students and then when they will guarantee that every student has the opportunity to learn not only what is FAFSA, but whether they believe it's important to fill that out, how they would do it, the skills to doing it, the date of when it's due, these types of things. So we want our, so that's just one example of a curriculum lesson, of course. There are three domain areas, academic, college and career, and social emotional, that we want to, just like teachers, have a scope and sequence to the work school counselors do. We'd like it to be scaffolded developmentally so that when students go between one school and the next, that the things they're learning from the school counseling program is scaffolded in the same way that mathematics or any other core subject would be. We also would really like to promote a family connection on curriculum, making sure that counselors either post their curriculum or present similar curriculum to parents in evening events or put in newsletters so that parents know what students are receiving. And finally, we wanna make sure that counselors are assessing what they do so that they can see whether or not it's working, is it making a difference, is it contributing to the student's knowledge and their change in behavior. I like to use the term franchising. It's kind of a business term, but it really does send a message about making sure that we are consistent about what we do. You know, you'll see two things here, the Hampton Inn and the McDonald's in Greece. I'll start with the Hampton Inn one. So many of our, our, our uh, folks at our company are training all over and we often stay at the Hampton Inn. And we like the Hampton Inn because we know what to count on at the Hampton Inn. Unlike some hotels that charge for internet or for parking or breakfast, we always know that we can go to the Hampton Inn and when we get inside, there's always hot tea and a cookie and free Wi-Fi and free parking and hot breakfast and we know what to count on. Now, there are mom and pop hotels, but when you go to a mom and pop hotel, sometimes you don't know what to expect and you might be a little disappointed if they don't have what you were looking for. Now, what does it have to do with McDonald's in Greece? Well, I do like to go to Greece every summer to revise some editions of the textbooks and to be thinking about new uh, strategies for implementing ideas for school counselors as well as vacation. And while I'm there recently on one of the islands, McDonald's was uh, new to the island and I thought, oh darn, there goes the island. This is a disaster because when you start franchising restaurants in a remote island, you kind of lose the whole point of the quaintness. Now it's quaint to have a franchise restaurant, uh, to have a mom and pop restaurants on an island and we don't really want to have uh, franchise restaurants so much because that's the whole purpose of going. But when it comes to schools and the work we do in schools, do we really want random acts of mom and pop school counseling? Or do we want to have consistent guaranteed programs and services and activities that people can count on? Now it's not to say that every school has to do it exactly the same, but it is to say that we should try to figure out what can every school parent and student and teacher and administrator count on from the school counseling program. All too often, school counselors bring their favorite lessons from maybe a former district or maybe from their graduate program or they saw it at a conference, and that's nice. But if it doesn't fit into a developmental preventative comprehensive plan for curriculum, then it's kind of random acts of curriculum instead of intentional acts of developmental curriculum that's connected to standards and connected to, um, to, what, to what students need. So when you look at the 20% based on local need, that's all about taking a look at, okay, what does the school need that's different, that's unique? So when you think about McDonald's, for instance, interestingly enough, if you go to Hawaii, they may have a pineapple on their burger, or they might have a McRib in the South uh, all year round, or you might in Australia actually have a beet on a hamburger, because local need says that's what they like. But you can always get that 80% of consistent menu. Well, what is our menu of services as school counselors? Is it consistent with a little bit of variety based on local need? Or is it basically mostly based on a school counselor's idea of what they would want to do individually, as opposed to what everyone in the school district agrees students deserve to receive? When we work with school districts, we like them to gather and talk about what can we all agree to at every one of our elementary, middle, and high schools. There, we don't have a perfect prescription because in most states and in most districts, there hasn't been one. 
In some states, there are some recommendations from the state departments, but in others, there are not. So counselors work together to begin to think about how will we prioritize what every student receives? When you look at this slide, you can see there's so many lessons that counselors with high ratios may not be able to do them all. How will they prioritize which ones go first? How will you scaffold them and put them in the scope and sequence? This is important work for school counselors in the same way that teachers in subject content areas do similar work deciding what are their main standards or their power standards that they will do because you can't always teach the entire book. So you have to make priority decisions and you have to decide which things you'll do when. There are many samples of this. Some of them are online in our online attend appendix and some are in our textbooks. But what we want counselors to think about is beginning to come together and gather as districts, not just as uh, independent counselors, but in their, in their schools, in their districts. If you're uh, fortunate enough to do it in your county, that'd be even better even more fabulous if there could be done in the state level. Um, but when you look at students' mindsets and behaviors and you think about what every student needs to know and be able to do developmentally, being able to come up with action plans like this, and I know you're looking at this one going, oh man, that's really a lot of stuff going on there. It is, but the thoughtful work of creating curriculum action plans with thought out lesson plans is important work for our master's degree professional school counselors and teachers do it, so why shouldn't our school counselors? The challenge for school counselors is that there's no Houghton Mifflin for us. You can't just go and buy one. You have to actually, in most places at high school level, create the curriculum yourself or revise and adapt it from maybe some national curriculum to meet your local and state needs. In this one in particular, you can see that the high school 101 lesson uh, al aligns not only with the mindset of behavior, but at the, in this district in Shasta County, which is five districts, they're aligning it also with the NOSCA Component 3, the National Office for School Counselor Advocacy Components that were put out several years ago and are still quite relevant and available online. You could look at the content that they plan to cover, what quarter they plan to deliver it in, and then each counselor in the different districts decides which subject they'll present it in, how many students will receive it, and then we look at some perception uh, data to decide what attitude, knowledge, and skills would the counselors like to collect data on, and what kind of outcome data that they want to look at to see if counselors, uh, if the students are heading the right direction. So this is just a sample of four lessons from ninth grade, and I'm going to go back one slide to say, here's some samples from an elementary, but there are many others. These aren't perfect. These are the ones that counselors are creating, but you'll notice here they're using evidence-based curriculum intervention, uh, in, uh, the evidence-based curriculum of second step, you may want to use some other uh, curriculum and we'll share some places you can find that curriculum a little bit later in this presentation. There are more samples on the website, by the way. If you would like to go to the website, we'll share with you later where that is. So I know that's quick, but that's core curriculum. Individual student planning is next. What does every student receive for, in terms of planning for their post-secondary options? Interestingly enough, across the United States, it's all quite different and it's called many different things. Some places call them four-year plans, some six-year plans, 10-year plans, education and, and career action plans. Some states um, legislate this, some do not. Some are very clear about what's expected, some are not. So it'd be important for the school counselors and administrators to take a look at what ILP requirements are, are in each state, um, what are the expectations, and then to begin to ask, when are we beginning to implement this? If you're waiting until ninth grade to implement a four-year plan, well, that's a challenge because we would really hope kids start in the seventh or eighth grade to begin to know what kinds of things will be expected of them when they're in high school to graduate and what the requirements might be then if they choose to go on to a variety of post-secondary options, do they know what they are? So in one of our texts, the um, text, the Hatching Results for Secondary School Counseling, we have an entire chapter actually on individual student planning and we take you through activities such as this one on the slide where you have counselors think through well, who will complete the, the individual student planning document? Will it just be the students? Will there be parents involved? What tool will you use? We find that many of our um, counselors are using a variety of tools in the same high school. We sometimes visit high schools where one counselor is still doing it pencil paper, another one is doing it on Aries, another one's doing it in Google Docs. The problem with this is it's not equitable for all kids and families and students. We need to find a way to agree upon what tool counselors will use, when they will deliver this uh, information to students. Will it be done one-on-one -on -one in a small group with parents? Will you do it every year or once in their four-year high school experience? 
these types of conversations should happen at a systems level and happen in a way where you're considering how will we guarantee at a minimum every student receives the individual student planning that they deserve to receive from the school counseling program. You know, all too often counselors like to say this is the way I do it. But the reality of it is we have to think about the way the program needs to do it. No longer do teachers, we hope, go into their classroom and teach whatever they want to teach. There is a scope and sequence, a pacing chart, common sense assessments to let teachers know what's required and when they teach which curriculum. So these types of planning tools are helpful to counselors as they're beginning these conversations. The third component of the uh, tier one would be district and school-wide activities. Counselors are often involved in things like transition programs and orientations, um, new student welcoming programs, some do college signing days and career fairs. Some do social emotional days like um, World Kindness Day and Day of Silence. But all too often these programs are selected by a counselor and not by the team of counselors and not by the district necessarily. Although many districts do do Red Ribbon Week sort of district wide, many of these other types of school wide programs and activities tend to happen based on a particular counselor saying they'd like to do it was working with a district not too long ago where some students going into one high school had a nice week-long summer bridge program. But if you went to another high school, you didn't get that opportunity. And therein lies another equity access concern because by virtue of being in this particular, in this particular area for that high school, you got to have an opportunity that other students didn't get to have. I was working with a uh, district that had multiple elementary schools and three or four of them were doing kindness day, but the other three or four were not. And we wondered, okay, are we not gonna be kind here? Well, of course they are. But the idea being that parents talk and students talk and they're often on the same soccer teams and baseball teams and community uh, activities and churches where they attend. And when your child has had the opportunity to have a college signing day and have a lot of pomp and circumstance around that, and another school doesn't have that in the same district, sometimes that can cause a little bit of inequitable opportunities for students to be celebrated. And the suggestion here is that counselors get together in their districts, if possible in their counties, and begin to talk about, will we or will we not do a college signing day? And if so, what should it look like? And how can we organize it? Are we gonna do summer melt counseling for our students or aren't we? If we are, how do we make sure that all students have that opportunity and not just the students in the A through L caseload? If we're going to do restorative practices, let's think about having all of our students have those opportunities as well. So this is a conversation that counselors can have and you gotta begin slow. This is a county that's decided to agree for in 12th grade that they will all do these items. They're gonna do similar survey for seniors. They're going to do college signing events and FAFSA completion days. And you can see how these activities they're doing align with their core curriculum lessons so that when they're teaching the lessons in the grade level, they can also encourage parents, uh, students to invite parents to these other events. When an entire county is doing the same events, then it's parents, if they miss one at one school, can then go to another school and get the same information they need. And so by doing more consistent, franchisable work in tier one, we have more opportunities for parents and students to receive what they deserve. So we're going to pause here, take a deep breath, <sighs> drink a water and say we're done with tier one. Tier two. So in tier two, um, how do students get there? Well, more often now, teachers are in, using MTSS are not just putting students in interventions. They're actually expecting that those, that those students will have data-driven needs for those interventions. And so what kind of interventions will we provide? Well, there's a multitude of them. And we hope counselors won't just think of small groups, but there's so many other things that they can do, check in, check out, and other evidence-based interventions that can happen at tier two. But the question would be, how do students get into tier two? What we're suggesting is that counselors, instead of receiving referrals and then putting students into interventions, that counselors take charge and take control and begin to own the data around data for tier two that aligns with their grade level and their domain area. So thinking about, are we going to look at attendance or behavior? If you're at high school, are you gonna look at AP potential? Are you gonna look at credit efficiency and students who maybe qualify but haven't filled out college apps? What kind of data do you wanna to use to drive interventions? The idea is that we are switching from referral driven where a teacher says, hey, where you say to teachers, 
does anybody think there's a student that wants to be in a small group or here I'm having a group uh, sign up your students to I'll find out who needs the tier two interventions by looking at grades attendance and behavior and then analyze the data and then provide the appropriate Thank intervention you. in our textbook in our textbook the secondary textbook um, and online because I know that this is also available online uh, we have a tool that you can use and download and use if you'd like to uh, that can really guide your conversation. So for instance, you see in this tool how students, uh, how counselors might select behavior. And then the question is, okay, is it one offense or two offenses or five offenses? When will counselors begin to look at that data to drive interventions? Will we be looking at the behavior for all students or for some? How, how soon will we be looking at that data? What's the time frame? So when you use the tool, it begins the conversation, and then you can end up with data elements like this. Now I'm gonna give you a moment to take a look at this. If you're elementary, you may wanna look at the left, and if you're high school, take a look at the right. So Wendy and Jacob, I am gonna answer your question because I think those are very important questions that you're asking. This is not to say that counselors shouldn't do things uh, like signing day. It is to say that as an advocate, Wendy, I would totally advocate for all students to receive those opportunities. And Jacob, when you're looking at planning tools to achieve the same results, if you're using the planning tools, yeah, it is important that the individuals are making those decisions are being very thoughtful. And that's why we like to have administrators and counselors work together to determine whether or not these are the appropriate types of first level screening. But as we're just beginning this work, we wanna be patient and kind with our school counselors who are just beginning and begin to have this opportunity to think about this differently than they have before. You can see on the right hand side of this high school one, the second one down with course failures, there's actually also an ARIES um, there, there's a query there that, that the counselors put inside. As they're beginning to think this through, they were putting the query in. And the idea is that when they do this, they'll be able to then have queries available, put, put a, a, um, an indicator or a reminder on their calendar. And here's another example of a different uh, county. And begin to think through, how often do we want to assess this data? Now they're saying every two months, you might say every month. These are decisions that the district counselor should make. But the idea is that if a counselor is doing these things alone, then if every counselor is doing it alone, students are getting very different experiences. To the extent possible, we would very much like counselors to collaborate with administration and central offices, counties, AEAs, and think about how they could come to some minimum agreements about what every student deserves to receive. And then if some places want to do a little more, they can, but at least at a minimum, there could be some guaranteed interventions for certain students. It's no different than with teachers. Teachers are also trying to come together and determine what are the data tier two element interventions that they deserve to receive and uh, how will they decide when they're appropriate or not. Now there are a lot of evidence-based interventions and our newest book that's actually coming out in December, beginning of December, we'll have a list of them at elementary, but to make sure you have them here, we won't go look at these today because uh, there's quite a bit of them, but you'll get a copy of this and you can go look at these on your own, but we'd ask that you not reinvent the wheel. Take a look at um, the evidence-based interventions. In fact, if you can go to an evidence-based national conference for interventions, you'll find a lot of them there. There's a wonderful evidence-based school counseling conference as well that supports that. One thing that I wanna point out here is that tier two isn't just for student behaviors for intervention. It's also for proactively supporting equity access. And let me share with you what I mean by that. Yes, you can look at students who have committed a certain number of infractions. Yes, you could look at students who have multiple Fs or multiple behavior issues, but a more proactive approach uh, to do a tier two could be students who maybe qualify for AP potential and you wanna make sure they're appropriately enrolled in AP courses. Maybe a student who qualifies for um, college and has applied but didn't do their FAFSA or a sign up for scholarships or maybe um, looking at students who are deserving of additional attention, our foster youth, our students with disabilities, historically underrepresented populations. Perhaps in your core curriculum, you're 
teaching everyone the information, but if you were to do something more for those students who deserve more and who have traditionally been marginalized and haven't had the opportunity to receive, receive additional supports, then it would be appropriate in tier two to say, I'm gonna provide these stu particular student groups um, something in addition to this so that they have more information on it and, and information that can support their success um, as well. Now let's move on into tier three. In tier three, we wanna make sure that we're very clear that school counselors are not therapists. Yes, they are trained in mental health and they do provide short-term, brief, solution-focused counseling and intervention, crisis response, and all types of ways to support students in crisis and in need. Some students enter tier three uh, because a crisis occurs. Maybe a student comes in from outside that has 10 credits at a junior level and you know that's gonna be an immediate intervention academically. Or maybe a student's had a death in the family. So some students are right into tier three. Other students move from tier two to tier three because the interventions aren't working and then they need an additional support system. So it's really important we know the um, uh, difference between counseling and therapy and that we remind ourselves that the American School Counseling Association has a, a plethora of information to support school counselors. It, if you're not a member of ASCA, um, you, it's really the, one of the most important things you can do to be part of your state and national association because they have position statements, ethical standards, they define the role of a school counselor, they have the mindsets and behaviors that can guide your curriculum and interventions, your school counselor competencies. Being um, an active and professional school counselor means you belong to these associations and when you have questions, they are here. So if you're not sure about the counselor's appropriate role in tier three, the position statements will guide you and give you that feedback as well as your ethics. You know, I like to tell a story about the babies in the river and I know I first heard it a long time ago from my colleague, Pat Martin, who used to tell the story and I've probably changed it a lot since she told it, but the idea is that counselors for the first time ever were actually gonna sit down and have lunch. And they were having lunch and no sooner did they sit down and open up their Subway sandwiches than they realized, oh my goodness, babies are floating down the river. We have to go rescue them. And so out they go all the way out into the river and they're rescuing babies and putting them on the dry ground and bringing them, they're doing it more and more coming and they realize one of their counselors, Brian, is gone. And they're like, hey, where'd Brian go? He's not here and just so we need him to pull out babies out of the river, he's gone. Well, sure enough, they finish pulling the babies out of the river, they sit down, they dry them all off, get them to their parents, and they start to eat lunch once again. And here comes Brian walking down the road, <whistles> whistling, Dixie, and they're like, where have you been, dude? We've been rescuing babies out of the river. And Brian says, well, I thought I'd figure out how they got in. So I went up to the top of the river, turns out there's a preschool up there. And the preschool, oh my goodness, the preschool had a broken lock on the door, and the door was open. And a whole bunch of kids were just crawling out into the river. And I said, that's ridiculous. I think I'll fix that door. And once I fix the door, I'm going to fix the lock. And then I'm going to teach those babies to swim. So if they fall in again, they won't drown. And then I'm going to show the teachers how they can rescue these babies sooner and throw out those little floating things sooner. And then he realized, you know, at the end of it, I might have to go upstream and figure out whose idea it was to put a preschool on the side of a river anyway. That was a stupid idea. Well, the idea behind this really is, for counselors to begin to think to themselves, are you spending most of your time with 10% of students? How do we spend our day? Are we rescuing babies or are we really getting out in front of this? Do we go upstream to figure out how we could prevent this? Are we doing enough prevention education and systems change? Are we serving all students as recommended by our professional standards and by MTSS or are we spending too much time there? Now at this point, I would normally, if we had a two or three hour presentation, I would show this once more. And then I'd ask folks who were in a session or if we were in a training session to go through each of these and fill out, where are you strong? Where do you know you need to improve? And where are some areas of thoughtfulness around this? Are these student issues or systems issues? So we're giving this to you so that you might use it on your own with your team and really be thoughtful about where are your strengths and where are your areas of thoughtfulness. Our hope is that counselors will begin to create systems so that their offices are less like emergency rooms and a little bit, a little bit more like planned, organized rooms. Is each day sort of a roll of the dice? Are we using the crisis of the day model? I know it feels like that sometimes, but what we're trying to do is put in place consistency, predictability, and systems. We want a system approach to delivering these services to kids, and we want those puzzle pieces to fit together and not be random acts of interventions. 
Do you have a data-driven systems protocol and processes in place which determine which students need tier two interventions? And what supports do they have access to when they do? You'll see here on the right-hand side, there's tier one, and you can monitor that data. And if the students don't need any more, then they stay in tier one. But if a student needs a tier two intervention, the idea is that you consult, you screen the student, you provide the appropriate intervention, whatever that might be, you progress monitor, evaluate, and then based on the evaluation, determine if that student needs back down to tier one, or maybe they need a tier three intervention. So this type of a thinking system is what we're hoping counselors will think about putting together. All too often when we visit districts and we talk to counselors about how they collaborate with other student service providers, we find that it's kind of random acts of service delivery. So as you can see, looking at this, these two pictures, there's an awful lot of overlap between counselors and social workers and psychologists. And you can see that there's an awful lot happening up in the top right hand corner. And when we're top heavy, sometimes it's because we're not doing enough in tier one. And sometimes it's because we haven't really sat down with our colleagues to talk about what systems can we put in place to divide and conquer so that we're not all seeing the same kids. And how do we make sure every student receives an intervention that they deserve? And how do we do a better job at tier two so less kids are in tier three? Sometimes it means having a conversation about what's your lane. You know, we're all going in the same direction trying to help kids. But sometimes we need to think about what our roles are, what is our expertise, what are we credentialed to do, what can we support our colleagues to do. You want to ask yourself, you know, if you're scooting over into somebody else's lane, do we put our blinker on first or are we carpooling with them? Are we all going in our own lane so much with blinders on we don't notice that other people are also seeing the same kids? How can we collaborate and coordinate our services to work together as a student services team? with students. More and more there's funding for all types of student service supports and it's great when counselors and social workers and psychologists and community partners work together to create these systems so that students get the best possible opportunities for interventions. So we've been talking a little bit about the science of the work. You know the art of the work of school counseling is really the counseling work that you do. When you meet with students, when you teach students, when you interact with parents, when you consult and collaborate, that's all the art and the beauty of the work of school counseling. But without the science of the work and evaluating and designing the systems, people might wonder what is the work of the school counselor. My hope is that when counselors marry the art and the science together, the people will no longer wonder at what counselors do, but they will wonder at the wonder of what they do. And it's pretty wonderful what counselors do. They get great outcomes every day. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the use of data text, this should be rather familiar to you. It's the conceptual diagram. The idea behind it is that counselors starting on the left with core curriculum would say to themselves, okay, what am I doing? When am I doing it? Where am I doing it? And for how long am I doing this curriculum? When I teach it, what kind of attitude, knowledge, and skills do I hope students will gain as a result from it? What behaviors changes do we hope we see in the students who receive our curriculum? What types of data will we measure that supports, we, I call that achievement related data because Research says this type of data supports achievement. We know that when kids attend and behave and our parents are involved, that that's related to academic achievement. So these kinds of data points support achievement. And then what kind of data elements are you collecting in your outcome data? So when counselors are writing SMART goals and they're doing curriculum and interventions, when we first look at the classroom lessons, you'd ask yourself, what is your process perception and outcome data and how does what you teach align to your outcomes? Conversely, when you're doing your intervention, you look for the data elements where you're challenged on the right hand side here. You look to see which students are attending, behaving, or doing classwork, or their grades, or, or other data elements are lacking and you're concerned. And as you look at those data elements, then you want to go to the left and say, what might be contributing to that? What behaviors are we hoping to change? Once you figure that out, then you want to ask, that, ask yourself, is it a student's knowledge, attitude, or skill that needs to be uh, supported? Not every student needs an intervention group for um, motivation. Some actually do need more tutoring or study strategies. So a school counselor acts kind of like a CSI agent to sort of figure out what that might be and then providing that intervention. So this is the uh, conceptual diagram that's dis described deeply in almost every one of our textbooks and can help you decide how you design and organize your action plans. You also notice that participation and mindsets and behaviors data are there because of the new ASCA language. 
Sometimes the data shows us that it's not a kid issue, it's a systems issue. When you look at these two data samples, you'll see if this is what it looks like with office referrals, you might ask yourself, do we need a systems intervention here? Because it's four times the number of boys referred over girls. When you look at the right hand side and you see the list of teachers here and all of the, the marks for ends and use that students got in their report card, you can see that in the top 15, 16 or above teachers, there are multiple students that might need an intervention. When you get down to about teacher 18 or so, maybe that's a teacher issue, not a kid issue. And maybe being responsible is something the counselor might benefit from doing another classroom lesson on rather than pulling these students out of a classroom. When you look at the data, we hope counselors will partner with their administrators to analyze it, look for trends and decide, is this a student issue or a kid issue? Some, and there's that conceptual diagram in the middle of this here, but sometimes these issues come up where 80% of students are failing a class. That's not a student issue, that's a systems issue. When, when you don't have a lot of students passing APs, maybe the teachers weren't trained in AP, or maybe the attendance issue isn't a kid issue, maybe you have a parent issue. Or maybe the discipline issue has to do with classroom discipline that's inconsistent and the lack of a school-wide PBS type system. So we want to think through sometimes these aren't student issues, they're systems issues. And when they are, we want counselors to think, oh my, let's step back. When that might seem like a paradigm shift for counselors, but what we want you to do is not just always think about the student in front of you, or maybe the groups of students, or just your students in your caseload, but just take a step back and look on top and look down over and say, is there systems issues here that are impacting all the students? And maybe we need to make a systems change. When we're looking at evaluating the work of what we do, it could be as simple as beginning to measure one thing, like I'm beginning to measure the students here, it says grades can affect my future and students learn the many grades, ways that grades could affect their future and how important it is to get good grades. Well, we hope they'll, that they'll do more than that. And as they look at, at doing pre-post assessments that we don't stop there, that we actually collect other types of data as well. The textbooks go into a lot of conversation about the ways to collect data, the ways to share data, um, the ways to uh, advocate for um, additional resources and additional interventions using data. You can see here on achievement related data that the intervention they did led to a drop in first grade detention and referrals. The second one was students with three or more Fs in quarter one, they met with their counselors and they had a reduction in the number of Fs. You can see here on the right hand side, the focus in tier one on FAFSA completion, but they also had a tier two intervention to grab those students who didn't sign up and make sure that they applied as well. And then of course, another outcome data showing dollars increased uh, for students earning funding. So we wanna make sure that when counselors are doing these uh, interventions that they're also measuring the impact of those interventions. So we've talked about a lot and you're probably thinking, okay, my plate's already full. I don't have one more thing I could put on my plate. And I wanna try to tell you that the idea here is if it's possible, if counselors could begin to think about how could we get a new plate? How could we sit with our team of school counselors and take an opportunity to say, okay, we got a lot on our plate. Instead of adding more, what if we just st took a step back and put everything out kind of like a buffet and said, what are we gonna put on our plate and really prioritize a healthier balance to the work we do? Using MTSS, you, MTMDSS, you can actually begin to organize and structure some activities and interventions through a thoughtful way. And our hope would be that as you begin to do the systemic change that you're patient with yourself. People think that they'll implement it and right overnight they get success, but we know that it takes time we know that, sit, that change can be messy sometimes, and we know that we need administrative support to do this work. This is one of my favorite slides that Leslie Oliver did a lot of work in this area um, in Australia on this, this type of work, and I've adapted it here for uh, our conversation. And it has to do with making sure that our context is ready for the mechanism of the work. Because if we're gonna bring in a common explicit language of MTMDSS or ask a model or protocols or goals, objectives, handbooks, anything you're gonna do, if your context isn't ready, if your political climate isn't ready, if your leadership isn't bought in, if the beliefs, assumptions, and philosophies are not on board, then the outcomes are gonna suffer. And so we wanna make sure that people are ready for this kind of work, are thoughtful about the work, and are ready to begin the conversations around the work. Because we can't just change in the middle. We have to really think about how do we prepare a climate that's ready for a shift and make sure that everyone's on board to be more consistent, proactive, um, in the work we do for students. And that's why it takes a team effort. 
you know, we, we are very fortunate today to have over uh, 50 principals who have joined our webinar. And I'm so grateful to them because without you, we can strive, but we won't thrive. Our administrators and counselors must work together as a team. They're, to take some steps forward, we need to get on the same page about what are our goals, objectives, and outcomes for the school counseling program, to make sure that school counselors and administrators work together to know their role in MTSS through the lens of MTM DSS, all three domains, and that counselors and administrators work together to share data, accountability, and advocacy for improved programs. So my goal was to stop at 420 when I got to here, and there we are. How are we doing, guys? Great. Dina, I think that was you. You and I were going to talk about the textbooks. You are doing wonderful. Yes, perfect timing. So um, as I mentioned at the start, Trish has authored several best-selling titles with Corwin, and we're showing a few of them here. Um, Data in School Counseling, Hatching Results for Elementary School Counseling, and Hatching Results for Secondary School Counseling. And then I don't know if you, we can go to the next slide and we can toggle back and forth. Coming in December, we have a new book coming out, Hatching Tier 2 and Tier 3 Interventions in Your Elementary School Counseling Program. Again, publishing December 10th. Um, we are offering a 20% pre-publication discount if you order at corwin.com. And I'd let, I'll turn it back over to you, Trish, to just kind of go over the differences between these four texts. Sure, yes. Well, I have to say the use of data in school counseling really came out of the work of the ASCA model. You know, I was so fortunate to work so closely with the pioneers in the profession, Norm Geisbers and Pat Henderson and Rob Myrick and CD and Curly Johnson and Saren Johnson, who really put their life's work and energy into the ASCA national model. And when we first wrote that model, it was great, but it, it really needed additional support. So following that, we did the evidence-based school counseling text with Carrie Dimmitt and Jay Carey. But then counselors felt they still needed more support. So the use of data book really became a book filled with, with information, a cookbook approach, and a lot of samples and examples of what we did in our trainings. We were trying to help districts to move forward with the ASCA model. And a lot of the work that we did in Renaval Unified, actually, when I was there leading that work many years ago. So the use of data book is, is a very comprehensive way that counselors can use data and accountability in many, many ways. The Hatcher Results for Elementary School Counseling focuses particularly on Tier 1. So it would be the Tier 1 of curriculum and uh, school-wide interventions. And then, um, hatch, and it also has pre-post assessments. And you can see the table of contents, I'm sure, in the core websites. And how to share results and, and management systems and things like that. It also includes the student engagement and classroom management activities. Um, where my co-authors, Danielle Duarte and Lisa De Gregorio worked very hard to make sure that the elementary school counseling text had many samples and examples of engagement and management in school-wide programs and activities. In the secondary school counseling text, that's co-authored by Whitney Triplett and Danielle also and Vanessa Gomez, it has a lot of information for secondary counselors on the individual student planning, school-wide activities, again, lesson plans, classroom engagement, strategies, pre-post assessments, and sharing results. The next text that's coming out, um, in fact, we're editing it today in a final edit, is the tier two and three for elementary, and that is with Ashley Kruger and Nicole Pablo and Whitney Triplett. And that one has been updated to include a conversation around ASCA's fourth um, edition, so it is going to be very current. And we hope in the next year or so to be able to do a tier two, three for secondary as well. So I hope that's helpful to our audience. Um, we also hope you will look and see our free resources. There's a whole bunch of them online. If you were to go to our website and go down under books, uh, where the little circle there is there, you can see under each of the books, it says online appendix. And you can, whether you buy a book or not, you can go in there and look at all the free stuff that's there and, and use that and, and begin to do this work in your district. There's many online appendices there. And then questions. I hope people who are listening today will not only share with us their questions, but also let us know what you value and what you'd appreciate more of. And now I'm gonna take a moment and look inside these chat questions and see if I can answer a couple of these. I know we have many of them. Let's see how many I can get through. Do you want me to uh, read you one? Yes, why don't you give me one there. What is the best way for high school counselors to deliver the counseling curriculum when there isn't a venue to do so? How do I deliver the curriculum so it doesn't seem like a one and done presentation? 
Well, that's such an important thing. Lately, we've been doing a lot more um, instruction in our trainings around the difference between presenting and teaching. I think one of the challenges counselors have when they deliver a curriculum in the classroom is that if teachers see them as presenting rather than teaching, meaning that the counselors are doing sort of, you know, they're sharing information, but it's really more of an informational sharing rather than an actual lesson that's been designed with the goal, objective, and outcome, then it seems less like instruction. When counselors connect what they do to standards, when they have goals, objectives, outcomes, when they're teaching and assessing, when students are engaged and in when counselors have classroom management, then teachers see counselors as educators and instructors the same way they are, and they're more likely to value that time. What I hear from teachers and administrators when they complain about it is that sometimes they believe that it's more of just a presentation rather than appropriate and, and important instruction. Another way to get faculty on board is to let them see the data that counselors are looking at and begin to realize that they have a, a large percentage of students perhaps who are not on target, who aren't graduating eligible, who do not know the credits it takes to graduate, who don't know the high school requirements, who aren't sure what a conflict resolution skill is, or that they're not aware of resources on campus. When they educate their faculty about what students don't know and imagine that they can't really pull every student in one-on-one -on -one to teach it all, the only efficient and effective way to do this organizationally is to teach it in the classroom. But it does require that counselors are quality instructors. And for some, that is new work. And for others, they may benefit from partnering with a mentor teacher or administrator to improve their instruction so that it's a good use of instructional time, it's quality instruction, and you can measure results and outcomes. It's been my experience that when there's quality instruction around important topics, teachers value that time. Even if it's the first time you get in, you have to use tricks to get in there, like doing it on a day when teachers are at in services or asking which teachers would volunteer. There's always a couple of new teachers who are really glad to have counselors in because they haven't had a lesson plan ready anyway. It's once the counselors begin to, to improve their reputation around teaching curriculum, where teachers are talking about how great a lesson was rather than what a waste of time it was, you see a shift. And this has happened consistently in the districts that we work in. When quality of instruction improves, when it's connected to data and outcomes, people want the counselors back. So it really is about us owning part of that responsibility and then being very thoughtful with our administrators about their support that's needed and making sure that counselors don't have to knock on the door and ask permission but that rather this becomes a part of what's expected. It, that's why having the franchised curriculum is so important because when the counselors at a district level agree on what curriculum every student will receive and the administrators are part of that and the district adopts it, now you have a program and curriculum that is an expectation when a student, when a counselor enters the job and it's not counselor driven, it's program driven. It's the setting up of the system of it all that's so important and that's why we need the support of our administrators to, to align with this work. Terrific. Uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. There are a few other questions, but what I'll do is I'll send you the list of questions and we can answer those and send those out to everyone. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that anyone listed here and I will answer them in an email and send them back to Corwin and then you'll all have those answers. And if there's anything uh, addition I can do to support you, don't hesitate to ask. We're, you know, it's, school counseling is such an important profession and every student deserves a school counselor. Um, and so I'm just hoping this helps you to not only share the results of what you do, the impact of what you do, but also advocate for more school counselors, quality school counselors implementing quality programs. Thank you so much. Yeah. Th thank you, Trish. We really appreciate you providing all this valuable information for us today. And just again, um, the uh, book that is coming out December 10th will be on a pre-publication discount until it publishes December 10th. Also, we will give you 20% discount on any books that you purchase on Corwin.com using a promo code webinars at checkout. And for more information about Corwin, you can certainly follow us on our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn channels. We appreciate your time today and look forward to seeing you on another webinar in the future.